code and emerging design for putting this whole shindig on. And even bigger thank you for saving me a plate of food before you vultures eat it all. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I'm in a very weird headspace because I've been locked indoors for the last two years, like most of you. So uh, I have no idea how this is going to go, basically. Let's just uh, put it that way. Also, if you want a copy of the slides, you can text the word green to this number and uh, give me your email address and you'll get the slides that way. This is not my cell phone, so don't send me pictures of your junk or anything weird like that. <laughs> I mean, you can send if you want, but I will actually get them. If you want to send me your junk, come up later like a, like a decent human being and get my phone up for that one. And then I'll, I'll, I'll leave this, like I said, I'm in a weird mood. Uh, like I said, uh, um, I'll leave this on the corner of the slide. So I, um, I don't live here. I live in Portland, Oregon. And everything we've heard is not necessarily true. Please come visit us. It's, it's a nice place. It's a little, a little crazy downtown, but the rest of it is gorgeous, uh, as Kelly will attest. OK. I also want to, um, I also want to apologize for, uh, for this. I've been locked indoors for two years, basically, and I feel like I have um, Whatever Alec Baldwin has, I feel like I've caught that, and I'm just... Eventually my head will get so big I won't be able to lift my head off the pillow, I think is where I'm headed. Uh, okay, let's start, the, let's start the serious stuff. So, um, I think, if anything, over the last couple of years we've learned that nowhere is safe. All of us are now susceptible to climate risk, and you've felt all of that. So I'm going to start with a little poll. And at the y-axis is everything from we're screwed to we're fine. And the x-axis is I feel good to I'm bummed out. What quadrant are all of you in? Like who's in who's in quadrant A? Yeah, we're screwed, but I feel great. Who's in that? Who's in that? This guy? Who's in quadrant B? We're screwed. I'm bummed out. This is my first time out in months. I Normally, I'm rocking in the fetal position at home. Who's in that? That guy? Who's in C? I don't know what you're talking about. The bachelorette's on. I feel great. We're fine. Everything's nobody. This guy. Well, this guy just sold, sold his company, so he's in a good <laughs> And then who's in D? Who's like, um, I'm bummed out, but, um, but it's not just the environment. I just kind of have my own issues going on with my mother. And, you know, my wife, who's in that? That guy in the back. Right. Right. I, um, I gave a, uh, six presentations this week, and they were all very weird. And so I want to remind you all that you are here in person. This is not Zoom. I'm, this is not, I'm not a hologram. Like, we're alive. I was in Dallas yesterday, and they were just like sheep going to the slaughter. Like, they just didn't, no laughter, no, this is like, why well, not a little bit, enjoy it. This is your last meal anyway. So, we, you know, just have a little fun. As I said, we've been locked up for a, a while now. And uh, now that we're emerging and coming out, what's the plan? Because I picked up a bunch of weird hobbies along the way. I, I started, I made these decals that I started putting in my bathroom. Towel dispensers everywhere. Just to amuse myself. Um, I started, oh, I started in, uh, an art collection. I take pictures of people that are completely unaware of themselves on Zoom. And I've got, I've got thousands of them. In fact, some of you are, are in it, actually. Uh, what else? I applied to be an astronaut. That's true. That's a true story. And um, I have not heard back. They have not, they have not contacted me back. Not really and, then, um, and then, as you heard, I wrote, I wrote another book. Uh, my pandemic book, I guess you could say. And it's on the circular economy. And the reason that I wanted to write about the circular economy is because I really see it as the framework we need for the problems that we are facing. Us. If the normal economy is essentially a linear economy, a take-make-waste economy, the circular economy is a different approach. It bends those linear loop, uh, lines into loops and changes take-make-waste into harvest, make, and remake. And companies like IKEA, Adidas, and Intel, and Patagonia have all embraced the circular economy uh, for the product line moving forward. So that's why I'm kind of excited about it. But the question still remains, where do we go from here? We've had this weird collective group trauma experience together. And um, if you think about it, 
What has been the biggest driver of transformation in your company in the last two years? Was it that your, I don't know, your CEO had some big, bold vision? Was it that your CTO rolled out some bold, innovative technology? Or was it that little guy? And I'm willing to bet it was that little guy, because that little guy kind of forced us all to realize that we could work from anywhere. So we can do innovative things, you know, when we're forced to. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about the urgency of what's facing us. I want to talk about how to redefine cost and talk about it in a different way than you might be used to. And I want to talk to you about how we approach innovation in Canada design and hopefully things that you can take with you and use in your approach. And so I want to start with the urgency because this is really quite urgent here. It's my high school humor coming through. Um, when I was in high school, this was the cover of the New York Times. This is June 1988. Uh, Jim Hansen from NASA testified in front of Congress and said, we need to do something where in 30 years the planet will start to become unlivable. That was June 1988, and 33 years later, almost to the day, the headline was incredibly accurate. Climate change has come for us. In August, we had the IPCC report, which has been called a code red for humanity. I don't know if you've read it yet, but it's pretty depressing. And one of the tidbits inside the report is that we've already released enough greenhouse gas to blow past our target of one and a half degrees centigrade. And so all hopes have been dashed in reaching that. And really, the big thing is to push now as quickly as possible to keep it below two. This shouldn't be a surprise to any of you, right? You've heard this has been coming now for 33 years. You've known this for a while. And yet we keep making dumb decisions. I mean, I'm as guilty of it as anybody, right? We make these dumb decisions that live with us for lifetimes. And we joke about it and all that, but it's it's really just dire. And this has caused me as an architect to kind of reshuffle my priorities. One of the things that I've learned is that the building is not just a building. We can't solve the world one building at a time. We need to solve it in a collective manner. What I see now is I see a building as being connected to a community, an interconnected web of infrastructure and legacy systems and neighborhoods. And if we're going to solve these problems, we one building at a time is too slow and too limited. So we almost approach every project now as a district scale project because we kind of have to. The other part of it is, is that we've designed these buildings based on a set of assumptions that are no longer true. And maybe they never were. We're doing a cancer center in Miami right now. And we're not designing the air conditioning system for 2021. We're designing the air conditioning system for 2050. We have to be looking ahead because the cooling load is just going to go up that much. We told them that they have to raise the site by 14 feet. And they raised it four and built a wall. That's kind of their temporary solution. But we're trying to look ahead. We're trying to think ahead. And some of these assumptions, not only were they never true, but they're really now working against us. And the trouble is that at the same time, we're about to build so much stuff. We're about to build, essentially, we're about to double the world's building stock by 2060. That's the equivalent of building the size of New York City every five weeks for the next 40 years. And if we do it the old-fashioned way, we're going to completely blow our carbon budget and not meet any of our goals. And at the same time that we're facing this, China is just consuming, consuming, consuming like a cookie monster, basically, on, on steroids. And just insane. They're building 50 bridges a year. They build one large dam every day since, and a half since 1949. They use more concrete in two years than we use in all of the 20th century. So it's just like inconceivable how much concrete and how much carbon they're emitting. And again, if they do it the old-fashioned way, they're going to completely blow our edge. And here in this country, we just keep buying cool stuff. There are $400 stores that are going to open every single day here in the U.S. So today, $400 stores open. Yeah. And uh, that's like a, what, every six hours or so, right? There are now more dollar stores than there are McDonald's, Walmart, and CVS combined. And they're just full of, you know, even there, they're full of crap, right? They're full of useless stuff. I mean, you know, if you buy things there, it's fine. But that's why we passed a rather grim milestone in 2020. For the first time ever, all of the global human man-made mass, all the stuff, now outweighs all life on Earth. So all the man-made stuff outweighs all the biomass, which explains why the richest guy on Earth is the guy that sells us a lot of this stuff, right? That kind of makes sense. That kind of tracks. And so this is why I've been obsessed with the circular economy. This is why I see it as the framework that we need. Because if we're going to change that take-make-waste approach, and move it into harvest, make, and remake, we need to fix it. Because every one of these stages, whether it's take, make, or waste, makes Kanye happy. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just bad across the board. 
Yeah, I feel like this is us. I feel like this is where we are. Just like, <laughs> just like, oh, you know, just completely, just look over, the, just look over your shoulder, basically. The other thing that drives me nuts is that every president since JFK has been briefed on the climate crisis. I don't know if people realize that. They've been made aware of the threat of climate change, and every president talks about it a little bit, but we haven't really done anything. And so I don't really think it's about the party. I don't think we're as divided as we seem. I think it's about something else. Not to mention the fact that despite everything we know, and despite Jim Hansen's warning back in 1988, more than half of the carbon that we've released has been since 1990. So we have done more knowingly than we ever did in our innocent ignorance. And that's kind of a problem. And you can't be surprised at this. Like, I've been sneaking into your mass media for decades now, right? I've been warning you about this. But still, this is where we are. And the decisions that we make in the next 12, 18 months are going to affect the entire next century. So do you want to have a hard decade or do you want to have a really hard century? That's what we're facing. We've really pushed it to the limit. Winston Churchill had a great quote. Uh, he said, I always count on Americans to do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted every other possible option. And that's kind of what we did here. That's basically we just like run out of time and run out of luck. So all of us are just like happy little dinosaurs, just completely unaware of what's looming over our heads. Look at your faces. I know this is depressing. I'm sorry. We'll get some jokes in the next one. All right. So um, Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great. Some of you have probably read that book. And at the back of the book, he has this exercise that he does with CEOs. And he asks them to name their five most brutal facts. And this is a great exercise. So I did this for the construction industry. What are the five most brutal facts facing us today in the construction industry? Number one is that climate change is going to change everything. It's going to put a price on carbon. And as soon as that happens, it's going to change how you and I build our buildings for our clients. Number two most brutal fact is that liability is going to make whole regions uninsurable. And when I say regions, I mean both geographic regions, like the southeast, but also whole industries, completely uninsurable. And we're already having those conversations now with the big six insurance companies who are coming to us asking us to figure out a way to mitigate climate risk. The third most brutal fact is that we still don't have a low carbon alternative to concrete, and we still use a lot of oil. Dan Overby talked today about uh, embodied carbon and concrete, and you know, I'm guilty of it too, right? We put a lot of carbon in our concrete. How do we overcome that? Number four most brutal fact is that the sheer demand for materiality and what we're about to build, if we're going to double the world's building stock, is going to require we get materials from somewhere else. So we can't just use natural resources. We're going to need engineered living materials. In other words, we're going to have to grow building materials. Whole new crops that are just for building. That's going to be required. And the fifth most brutal fact is that we're going to need to deploy technology in a way that we've never done before we've never even considered before. And we're not doing it yet in the construction industry. Yet, I know some of you are working on it, but it's still pretty slow. So this really leads to the six things that we're trying to do now in every single project, regardless of the line. Number one, we make it as efficient as possible. Right? We model as early as possible. We bring the EUI down. We really design towards clear outcomes. Number two, we try to target net zero on every single project, whether the client wants it or not. Number three, we use every tool in our toolbox to do that because of this urgency that we've going on. Number four, we measure everything measurable, and that includes a big push for electrification, getting fossil fuel infrastructure out of buildings. Number five, we have to do it now. We can't talk about it, we can't have any more stupid meetings about it, I can't have another committee that I jump, like I'm done. And finally, number six, we have to use nature as the technology. Bioremediation, fiber remediation, you know, uh, passive solar, passive ventilation, thermal mass. Use nature and physics and biology as the technology, because that's really ultimately what it is. And when I say deploy technology, I mean deploy technology. Because if you think about it, look at other industries and what they do with data and insights. We're not doing hardly anything with it. We're also just dabbling with automation and prefabrication and so forth. Uh, you know, Canon Design, we own a prefabrication company. That's how seriously committed we are to this idea. This idea of building off-site beforehand has a lot of advantages. So what we need is we need like extreme makeover carbon emissions, what we really need. And I don't know if we're fully like, mentally prepared for that. We need to get to zero by 2050. And most of those cuts need to occur by 2030. And 2030, by the way, my clients keep telling me it's 10 years away. It's not. I looked, it's like eight years away. And uh, so that's even crazier. Eight years is uh, 
uh, 96 months, isn't it? Like it's, we can count the number of days to it. So we need, we have no time. So we, that's the urgency of the space. We tell all of our clients, if you have a 2050 plan or 2040 plan, whatever plan you have, that is a today plan. There's no such thing as a 2050 plan. Dust off whatever your little climate action plan is and put it into effect now. You can't wait until December 2049 and think, oh, we should do something like this. We had a client, we were in a meeting, and they started rattling off a bunch of stats. And they said, oh, well, you know, by 2020, uh, we'll be at 80% of our carbon. And they, they kept saying 2020. And I said, excuse me, um, you keep saying 2020. You know it's 2021, right? And they're like, oh my god, you know, we've been saying this stat for 10 years now. I didn't realize. Yeah, OK. And then they quietly changed their website to update all the 2020s to 2025. So they just bought themselves another five years. And you all know the client, too, so I can't say the name. But a rhyme for a strange book. OK, so. Um, you didn't hear it from me. So, uh, I saw this tweet. This is a guy that I follow in Seattle, and he's got a brilliant insight into urban planning. And he said this simple thing over Christmas that just blew my mind. He said, you know, we could take the equivalent of 10 million cars off the road if we just took 10 million cars off the road. And that, I don't know why, that blew my mind. I'm like, oh my god, we never think of it that way. Yeah, let's do that. I'm all in for that. Because the thing I struggle with on a daily basis is this idea that anytime we demolish a building, anytime we build a dumb concrete glass box, or anytime we don't target net zero energy, and like I said, I'm as guilty of it as anybody, if anytime we do these things, isn't that a form of climate denial? Isn't that basically denying the reality that's facing us? And I struggle with this, and this keeps me up at night, and it bothers me. And I don't know what to do about it. I mean, I'm doing stuff, but you know, it's like, man, whatever this gesture is, that's what's going on in my head all the time. And so what we're committed to is like finding ways around this. The other thing is, and I just want to throw it on your radar, is this big push for electrification. I feel like any time we're putting fossil fuel infrastructure into a client's building, we're doing them. We're doing them to a high carbon future. And if this carbon tax, fine, penalty, whatever, you know, comes on board, we've essentially doomed them to a building that they won't be able to afford or operate. Really. Anytime we demolish a building and don't salvage it for parts, that's a carbon budget that we can't afford either. And then finally, refrigerants, which nobody wants to talk about, but very unsexy, I know. But we've really been pushing on low global warming potential refrigerants because they have such a huge impact and they, they're like the silent killer. They're like, the, uh, you know, Fritos or something, but in buildings. Like, they're just, you know, nobody talks about it, but it's there. I thought that joke would get more. Okay, so, and you might be thinking, holy crap, Reed, aren't you depressed? No, that's the weird thing. Like, I'm more optimistic now than ever before in my, you know, senility. I don't know why, but I feel like, here's what keeps me uh, happy is we changed the, the planet's entire climate by accident. We weren't trying to do it. We did it, and it was by accident. What gives me hope is thinking, imagine what we could do if we tried. Imagine what we, if we put our minds to it, imagine what we could do. And believe it or not, that, that you know, helps me sleep at night. OK. Number two, redefining cost. So this is the weirdest thing that I've been struggling with. Um, we build $1.6 billion stadiums that are used eight times a year by people spending money that they don't really have and can't really afford to watch a bunch of millionaires play a game. Nobody blinks twice at it. No, great, new stadium. They're excited about it. And all I hear about is never know what it costs, but how excited they are about it. I was in a meeting with a client. We were doing a cancer center. And I said, I said, you know what? Here's a good idea. Why don't we not put cancer-causing chemicals in the cancer center? And that, that seems like a smart idea. And they're like, brilliant. I'm like, great. And the client's like, what will that cost? And I'm like, well, in the long term, it'll cost you nothing, because I'm a sustainability consultant. That's what we always say. But in the, in the short term, sixteen thousand dollars. It'll cost you sixteen thousand dollars up front to not put cancer in the cancer center, which we all agreed already it was a good idea. And like, I'm you know sitting on pins and needles waiting for the client's face to stop making that face that he likes to make. And as that sixteen thousand dollars was still in the air, it was still like in the room floating. And he said, oh yeah, that reminds me. And he turns to the engineer and he says, where are we with the $26 million parking garage we're doing next door? Is that done yet? So again, we're quibbling over $16,000, but $26 million to subsidize everybody's free parking habit? Unquestioned. So I don't think it's about the money. This is my suspicion. I think it's about something else. I was in a meeting the other day and the engineer, we're talking about the project, the engineer made a joke. 
and he said, um, hey, you know, I ate a salad today. How many weed points did that get us? It's like, you know. And everybody laughed and was like, ha, 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 very funny. And I said, look, everybody knows that if you eat a salad, it's uh, two. It's two lead points. Everybody knows that. But that's not the point, right? <laughs> right? It's just about something else. So again, I don't think it's about the money. I've been fascinated by GM as a company because somehow they convinced the American taxpayer to subsidize all of their infrastructure. We spend $177 billion a year subsidizing the freeways in this country. GM doesn't pay for it, but it's their infrastructure they benefit from. All in, we spend $2.6 trillion since the 1950s to, su to subsidize freeway infrastructure. And nobody ever questions it. They see it has value, they like it, they benefit from it, they use it, and it's never about ROI. They're not getting the same tax that you and I get all the time. Well, what's it gonna cost? It just happens. And it made me realize nobody questions the coffee and the donuts in the break room. Nobody asks me, what's the ROI of the Christmas decorations every year? We just do it. We have a budget for it, we spend it. Everybody's happy, right? So it's not about the money. It means that you and I have failed to convince people that it's about something more than the money. It's about the value. So what we've done is we've shifted how we talk about the projects. Because if you just chase the ROI, if you just chase the payback, it becomes a trap. We still do it, of course. But we don't start there. We start with the outcome and the benefit that sustainability provides. I'm not selling you on a green roof. I'm not selling you on a lead. I'm selling you on the benefits that those things provide. And the truth is, they provide a lot of benefits. A green school has higher test scores than students. A green office has higher worker satisfaction and lower absenteeism, lower turnover. A green hospital has higher patient recovery outcomes. So we show these outcomes to the client at the beginning and we put a dollar value on it and go, what is this worth to you? And if we do that at the beginning, we bake in these outcomes at the beginning, then they don't get value engineered out. The truth is that a happier workplace is productive and makes a lot of money, and those things have value. So that means if you do your job right, sustainability doesn't cost you money, it makes you money. And it gets us out of that weird apples to apples, or in this case, oranges to oranges comparison of like trying to play this ROI chase. Nobody questions the $26 million parking garage. That's where I want to get to. That's what I aspire to. I want nobody to question, let's not put cancer in the cancer center, <laughs> right? Because there are orange slices, and then there are you know, orange slices. And so getting that comparison game is a bit of a trap. The second thing is we have to change how we measure these things. I watched that, um, I don't know if you saw it, on HBO it was the the series on Chernobyl. Did you see it last year? It was really good. And one of the things that stood out to me, and I think those of you who watched it stood out to you too, when they were having the little incident at Chernobyl, the nuclear incident, the engineer said, no, it's fine, because the, the number is 3.6 Runkin. Do you remember that? And he said, look, it's fine, it's 3.6 Runkin. Well, it turns out the meter that measures radiation only went to 3.6. And he's like, look, it's 3.6. The real number was 15,000 run him, but the meter didn't go that high. And so he thought he was fine. And it made me think, I wonder if we're doing that in buildings. Are we measuring with meters that only go up to 3.6 when the real number could be more? And so the, the type of impact we're talking about is much more um, uh, opportunistic than that. All told, we could save about $10 trillion by the end of the century if we save ourselves. $10 trillion if we keep uh, the climate below 2 degrees centigrade, essentially by the end of the century. $10 trillion sitting on the table that will go to waste if we don't do this. So I see this not as a challenge, but ultimately as an opportunity. Think about the normal healthcare experience. You got the long waits, you got the uh, uncomfortable, stressful experience. It's awful, dreadful. Think about the typical education experience with the uninspiring spaces, the bad lighting, and just waste everywhere. Think about the typical office experience. Bad air, bad light, bad connection to your neighbors. It turns out that if we start to measure some of these outcomes and change what we measure, we can change the world. But I'm not saying that hyperbolic. I mean that literally. If we change what we measure, we can change the world. So think about how we normally measure success in a building. Right? It's cost per square foot. We're all good at that. Maybe it's revenue per square foot. Maybe it's ROI and payback. But how should we measure success in a building? Couldn't we also measure the recovery times and patients, the stress reduction in families? 
the, the uh, staff retention. All those things have value. I can put a dollar value on it. My clients all aspire to those things. And buildings can help achieve those outcomes. And how could we measure success in a building? Couldn't I also measure how much energy it produces, how much carbon it sequesters, or how many species it provides a home to? Yes. So if we change what we measure, we can change the world. So we keep adding to what are the things that are measurable? What are the things that we can quantify? Again, my goal here is to get to $26 million parking garage goes on the question. That's where I want to get to. That's what I'm jealous of and aspiring to. Which leads us to number three, how we approach this with our clients. And again, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible so you can take this and run with it. What we do is we don't add on sustainability. We don't tack it on. When I first came to Canon Design, that's what they did. And every firm does it. It was two pages in the back of the proposal. <coughs> oh yeah, we do this, we've done this many lead projects, blah, blah, blah. And it failed. And what I told them at the beginning was, we need to aspire to sustainability needs to appear on every page of the proposal. It needs to be part of every narrative we tell about it. It needs to be baked in from the start. One of the big, big key changes that we did was, we have our little meetings for our project. We're sitting around a bunch of experts in the room, very expensive table, right? We've all been at those tables. $2,000 an hour or whatever it is for cost of clients, right, to sit around this table. And everybody wants to tell you what they think. And so what I do is at the agenda, I move sustainability in front of the agenda. The first thing I say to them is, don't tell me what you think. I already know what you think. Instead, I want you to tell me what you wonder. I want you to tell me about the possibilities. What are we capable of here? And that shifts. It's a minor thing, but it shifts the conversation. And suddenly, they're like, I wonder if we can get net zero on this. Yes, I wonder that too. What would that look like? And then we have that conversation. It's a very minor thing, but it is hugely impactful. And it all really came from this idea that smart people, the first thing they tell you is how dumb they are. I don't know if you noticed this. Truly smart, like the smartest man in history, Aristotle, or Socrates rather, is most famous for saying, all I know is that I know nothing, right? That's what he's famous for. And I think there's a correlation here, because there's plenty of dumb people that tell you all the time how smart they are. So I think smart people, <laughs> I think smart people like to tell you, you know, the opposite. And um, uh, this also kind of leads me, and this is going to be, you're, gonna, you're not going to like this joke at all, but I think it's hilarious. You all have to remember that all of us are, no offense, by definition, of average intelligence. Right? If we take, look, I just lost the crowd. I told you to come back. <laughs> all right, that joke didn't go so But here, let me give you another example. This is a town in North Carolina, it's called Wood, uh, Woodland. They voted to ban solar panels in Woodland. Why did they ban solar panels? Because they were afraid the solar panels would steal the light from the plants. I'm not talking about shading the plants. I'm talking about if they brought solar panels into the town, that somehow their voodoo would steal light away from all the plants everywhere all the time. And uh, one of the people on the panel on the committee was a retired science teacher. So, You've also just seen what two years of bad science understanding has brought us. Right? Mass confusion, mass craziness. And we have a whole contingent of people that think that they're really, really smart. And, you know. And so this idea that we've had for 30 years, this notion that the modern environmental movement is somehow we're going to get everybody to just agree and want to do. Like, I'm just over that. I don't think it's going to happen. Like, you think you're going to get everybody to agree? on climate change, it's just not, let's just force it on, basically. That's, like, I'm all in favor of, you know, a dictatorship if, you know, one of us was in charge, basically. Let's force it on because we're not going to do it willingly. And if you don't believe me, just think about how people interpret the word green and tell me what you think about that. <laughs> Besides, people are busy. They're distracted. They have other things. They have more important things in their lives. Like, whatever the hell's going on with ketchup right now, they have other things to worry about. And it's not this. So what we need to do is we need to engage them in an innovation strategy. And the thing about innovation that we've learned is that it's, it's messy. Innovation never looks the way you want it to look. For example, the man who invented the light bulb did it by candlelight. So innovation is never how you appear, how you think it'll be. It's quite messy. And the truth is that companies that fail to innovate die. They go away. If you look at the Fortune 500 companies from 1955, they've almost been virtually completely replaced. By 2027, 75% of the current Fortune 500 companies will no longer be here because of a lack of innovation. When I was a kid, Kodak was synonymous with photography. They were one and the same, right? They owned the space. They had the biggest valuation. And they were replaced by a company that is less than 15 years old, basically. The 
that started with, by the way, 15 employees. Which is why virtually every CEO knows that innovation is a key strategic priority for them. So what I'm advocating for is we use sustainability as an innovation strategy. That's really what it is. My childhood is filled with wonderful things, things that I loved and spent a lot of time with, alone, right? The things that I enjoyed, and they went away. And they went away because the company stopped innovating. At some point, they failed to continue the innovation. And most companies are not built for innovation or building new models. Most companies are built to maintain the status quo and efficiency of existing models. So how do you engage them? in an innovation strategy. You need to choose innovation. It doesn't just happen. It won't sneak up on you. It won't come in from one employee. Everybody has to participate. At Canon Design, we like to say that innovation is an avalanche, meaning that every snowflake contributes to that avalanche. Every snowflake must participate in the avalanche. And by the way, I know what I'm talking about because Canon Design was voted the second, number two, most innovative company in North America. Not most innovative architecture firm, I'm bragging now, but most innovative company and I know what you're wondering, who was number one? Chobani Yogurt. I know, it's weird. Can we just talk, can we just talk for a minute? Uh, it is weird to lose to a friggin' yogurt company. They make a good yogurt. I grant them that, I give them that, but it's a yogurt company, like really? I'm, I'm done, I'm over it. Okay, so, um, so at Canon Design, what we've done is we've committed to doing this. We're trying, we're seeing if it works, but basically target net zero on every single project, whether the client mentions it or not, cut embodied carbon by 2030, which is in eight years, not 10, as we've figured out, and do a healthy material strategy and a resiliency strategy on every single project. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like, but it really starts with pain. <laughs> pain is the gateway to innovation. What the client is sick of is where the opportunity to innovate comes from. So we map out what their pain points are. What is driving you crazy? What are you spending a lot of money on? What's bothering you? What's keeping you up at night? And suddenly that's the opening I need to introduce an alternative idea. The things they're happy with, that's gonna be hard. I gotta pry that out of their hands. But the things that they're painful with, that's different. And using this philosophy, using this approach, is how we've been able to have dozens of projects that are the greenest building on their campus or the healthiest building in their system. A big provocation at the beginning. And again, we're not two pages in the back of the proposal. We, at the front of the agenda, in the proposal, at the kickoff, putting sustainability first as our first foot forward and giving them this big vision. And if you bake this vision in, you get buy-in on this vision, this doesn't get value engineered out. Right? If we're designing for certain outcomes, they don't get value engineered out. And then I remind them that everything I'm showing them has value. It has a payback. It might not be financial, direct financial payback, but it has a payback. It has a value. We can quantify it. So not putting cancer in the cancer center has a value. It might not be a linear like 38 month you know, ROI type thing, but it has a value. One of the things we do is we give them a bunch of priorities and I have them set the dials to what their priorities are. In a year, typically year, I'll do 100 workshops. It sounds like a lot, it's not, it's like two a week. But I'll do 100 workshops in a year. And I have to say, every single time, I am delightfully surprised where they set the dials. It's never where I expected them to set it. It's never where their RFP hinted that they would go. They're usually mentioning things that they've never brought up before that are a priority for them, which shows that the system is a little broken. We do the same thing with ROI and payback. Because what we found is that things like HVAC systems, they're willing to wait 12 to 15 years for that payback. But staff upgrades, maybe that's a two to three year thing. They want to see that for a little quicker. And so we'll set payback the ROI gauges, essentially. We'll also find a blanket ROI. So what I'll say to them is, if we find anything that has more, you know, less than a seven-year payback, can we just do it, not even ask you? Just do it automatically? And they're like, oh yeah. And we'll negotiate that number. We do the same thing with waste and what they're spending money on to get rid of. And this is a great conversation. Again, pain leads to innovation. We do the same thing with risks and liabilities. What are they worried about? What's on the horizon? We've been doing more and more looking at ESG and upcoming regulatory requirements because we want to know what's coming down the pipe too so we can warn our clients about it. In terms of resiliency strategy, we do a resiliency dashboard for every single project. We're doing these in the proposal phase now. We're not even waiting until we win, we just because I can do them in 20 minutes. This is our typical dashboard. This one's for Denver, but it, we do it for any site. And essentially it looks at all the relevant climate risks, and then we turn those into societal risks. What are the likely outcomes of that happening? So the idea is that no matter where they are in their sustainability journey, if they're just getting started and they're at the Camry phase, if they're really 
really into it and they're at the Prius phase, or if they're like hardcore nut jobs and they're at the Tesla phase, wherever they are in their sustainability journey, we meet them and can benefit them. And that's how we can get to this idea of we're designing dozens of these projects that are the healthiest building on campus or the greenest building on campus. Because we bake these outcomes in at the start. This is Alone College in California. It's a net zero, uh, net zero energy campus, not just building. And uh, also, uh, uh, which is kind of fun. This is the Resnick Center for Sustainability on Caltech's campus, an otherwise pretty great campus already. This will be the greenest building they've ever done. It's a mass timber frame with a concrete core because of the labs inside. Um, so low invited carbon, low EUI. And then that parametric facade is designed to heat, keep the heat gain out, but let the daylighting in. It's the first time we've done parametric modeling, not just for a cool shape, but actually for a function. <laughs> uh, this is University of Florida Student Health Center. This client came in asking for lead silver. And when I said lead silver, what do you want that for? I'm like, we don't know. We, just, we thought we were supposed to. And I said, well, what are you interested in? And they said their priority was health. So that turned into a conversation about well, and then that became well platinum. This is University of Illinois, Albany Hall. It's the building on the right there. That's the new build that we're doing. Uh, Green's building on the campus. And then across the street, we're renovating that 1834 building that's called Bob Kelly Hall. So we're doing both at once, and they're both going to be new platinum. This is uh, Penn Medicine's Princeton Cancer Center. This is in Jersey. That uh, whole facade is, uh, faces south. And so it's a double curtain wall facade that has a thermal chimney in it. So in summer, the heat rises and that cools the building. And in the winter, that heat is captured and heats the building. This is one of those cancer centers that we're not putting cancer in, by the way. And the client's like, that's a brilliant idea. I'm like, yeah, I know, right? Uh, these are the tools that we use, similar to probably the tools that you use. If uh, you're just getting started and don't know where to begin, start with mindful materials. It's probably my favorite one as a starting point. And that'll get your foot in the door. And then if you're looking at embodied carbon, we use Tally and EC3. Tally is a Revit plugin which is confusing, but um, someone at your firm will figure it out. And then EC3 is the Body Carbon Construction Calculator. These are kind of our two, and uh, this is what we're going for. And then um, these manufacturers, I have no affiliation with them, but they're all doing uh, great, lovely things, and so I just applaud them for their transparency uh, with EPDs and so forth, so we get started. And then I'm going to jump around a little bit. Also, I just wanted to show you this. This is a company that I advise called Clavel. It's recycled foam glass gravel. So it's like a replacement to normal gravel, but it has zero carbon footprint. It's kind of amazing. We're also tracking all these concrete alternatives. Uh, these are the eight that we typically follow, but there's others. Um, they're all doing some version of the same thing. Carbonate is found a way to speed up carbonation. Uh, Solidia is injecting CO2 directly into the voids of the concrete. Blue pattern is coating the concrete with CO2. It kind of looks like raisin nut gram. It's kind of weird. Uh, Carbon cure injects the CO2 into the water instead of the voids. Lafarge is uh, supposedly using recycled aggregates. And Hoffman has like a huge blast furnace. It's like fly ash SEM thing that they're doing. And we're just tracking what they're doing. We're also following the kind of growing materials. This is Biomason. Their, their goal is to grow concrete, so they're mixing bacteria with with recycling aggregate to do that. This is Ecovative. They're growing essentially this from mushrooms. It's mycelium fungus, but they're growing finished materials, insulation. And then we're tracking a whole bunch of natural materials that are just natural and zero carbon anyway. And then we look at the embodied carbon of all of them. And then we know that the big four are glass, concrete, steel, and aluminum, which is basically your structure and your curtain wall is the majority of it. And now we're starting to look at our MEP systems to do the same with a big push towards mass timber. Uh, we've been obsessed with it. I've been obsessed with it forever. I live in Portland, which is like the master of capital. But we're pushing it as, as far as we can on every project. And then there's two materials I just want to point out to you. This one's called Opus 12. They're taking CO2 and making products out of it. And this one's uh, from New Light. It's called Air Carbon. They're harvesting carbon from the ocean and turning it into this reusable, infinitely recyclable plastic, which is kind of cool. All right, I'm jumping. OK. So in the time that I was talking, um, Another 1.5 million tons of CO2 have been released, not from my mouth, just uh, you know, in general. And uh, so it shows me that carbon is not sleeping, it's not resting, and we can't either. We need to up our game here. I'm hoping that this uh, opened your eyes a little bit to our approach, and you can take something with you to do that. But if you can sell the clients on this outcomes-based approach to sustainability, you can get them bought in at the beginning, isn't that ultimately the high of the end rainbow, really? And if we can do that, wouldn't that just make everybody happy? So with that being said, like I said, I'm happy to share the slides. If you text green to that number, you can do that. Or it can be a business card either way. 
Uh, either way is fine. But otherwise, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. And, and keep on pushing. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me enjoy the rest of the conference and keep on doing this. This is one of the weird here. So congratulations.